big hello to everyone right across Calvary joining us for church tonight. We are in Townsville where the people are very quiet and sombre in Townsville. It's very rowdy in Townsville. And uh, a huge hello to everyone uh, on the Sunshine Coast. Can we welcome our Sunshine Coast campus? A big hello to everyone in Cairns. Uh, great to be connected with Cairns. And I was in church in Cairns last Sunday night. It was absolutely pumping in Cairns last Sunday night. And so it's so great to be connected with our Cairns church family. Hello to everyone who's joining us online. And uh, it's been a great day in church. Tim and Aisha Peters, we should be praying for them. They're in East London preaching today and at our campus in South Africa. So they're probably jumping up to preach real soon. But uh, it's great to have you in church tonight, whichever room you're in, whichever campus you're in. I'm really believing that God's Word is going to encourage us and help us tonight. So uh, as you sit down, just nudge the person next to you and say, you chose well tonight. Well, I'm excited because uh, it's a new series Sunday. This morning in church, we launched a brand new series, which we have called 10. Uh, it's about grace, freedom, and the good life. We're taking six Sundays across our church to talk about the Ten Commandments and how they apply to our lives and what they could possibly say to us in our modern era. Um, by the way, uh, we've got on the YouVersion Bible app all of the notes uh, for today's messages, including this message that we're about to walk through together now. So you can grab your Bible out, uh, your Bible out, you can grab your phone out, which has got the Bible on it, and uh, open the YouVersion Bible app, click events and uh, access the message notes. And as I said this morning, I'm just going to assume you're not on Instagram or checking the football scores. I'm going to assume you're following along with the Word of God. That's what we're all doing, right? In Cairns, on the Sunshine Coast, pay attention. That's what we're all doing. So we're going to jump into it tonight. And uh, the truth be told, most of us probably don't really think about the Ten Commandments that much. I mean, if you don't normally go to church, you probably never think about the Ten Commandments. If you do normally go to church, you probably don't wake up in the morning first thinking about the Ten Commandments. When you're pushing the trolley through the grocery store, you're not really thinking about, you know, um, commandment number four. And uh, when you're interacting with your colleague at work, you're probably not thinking about what Moses said three and a half thousand years ago. Most of us probably don't live our lives with the Ten Commandments at the front of our mind. Uh, many of us would think that the Ten Commandments are just outdated. Uh, in our first message of this series, we talked about the fact that even though the Ten Commandments are three and a half thousand years old, um, society has got better living standards, but I don't know that we've got better moral standards, do we? Martin Luther King Jr. said we have gui uh, guided missiles and misguided men. Uh, we have people who are obsessed with lifestyle, but don't have the faintest clue how to put their life together. And, and so even though the Ten Commandments are three and a half thousand years old, who knows, we need wisdom more than ever before. And so they're, they're not outdated. I would rather say they are timeless and they are timely in terms of giving us wisdom. Other people would say, well, the Ten Commandments are obsolete, right? Because Jesus came and now we don't need to worry about any of that stuff from like in the Old Testament before Jesus. But, but Jesus himself told us that we should take them seriously. And the Ten Commandments were never designed to teach us how to save ourselves. They were designed to teach us how to, having received the grace and the mercy of God, how now to get on and live a life that actually honours God, pleases Him, and helps the people around about us. Um, other people think the Ten Commandments are oppressive. And this morning, uh, if you missed church, I sung a little bit of Elsa from Frozen because I'm pretty gifted like that. And uh, we, we talked about Elsa. Anyone here, you, you know the movie Frozen? Just a, a few people. I've got four kids aged six and under, so I'm tortured with those movies all the time. And uh, Elsa, of course, lives by the mantra, no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm... <laughs> one, one person in Townsville committed then. In Cairns and Sunshine Coast, I'm sure everyone was belting it out. No right, no wrong, wrong no rules for me. I'm free. And uh, we tend... That's enough. We tend to think that freedom is having no rules, doing whatever we want. But, but we talked about the fact in our first message today that 
freedom is not doing whatever you want, because if I just make any choice, I could end up a work addict, a porn addict, a substance addict. You can end up enslaving yourself to a whole lot of lesser forces. So, so freedom is not just choosing whatever you want. That won't keep you free. Freedom is actually becoming the person that you were intended to be. And the way we do that is by embracing a particular set of restraints or laws or commands or guideposts which help us to be the people that God has called us to be. Now, I want to read um, one more excerpt by way of catching us up from a book by John Dixon because I know there'll be people in this message who weren't in our first message and you're wondering, what on earth are the Ten Commandments? Like I vaguely heard something about it. And so let me, let me read for you because this will give you some context. John Dixon writes, the Ten Commandments are a collection of laws given by Moses to the newly constituted people of God, Israel. For centuries, the descendants of Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, had been a slave nation in Egypt, where they were put to grueling work by despotic pharaohs. Moses emerged from among these Israelites to lead his people to freedom. He was the Martin Luther King Jr. of the second millennium BC Middle East. Let my people go, was his plea to the Egyptian overlords who finally acquiesced after a series of disasters sent on Egypt by the Creator. After leading his people into liberty, Moses was called by God up Mount Sinai and given the law we find in the Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The very first instructions were the Ten Commandments. And so this morning, we talked about three lenses through which to view the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments. The first is the lens of grace, where we understand that we follow the Ten Commandments, not so that God will love us, but because we've already realized God does love us. He proved it through Jesus. And so we follow them as a willing, joyful obedience to honor God. Secondly, we talked about the Ten Commandments being a pathway of freedom. We've covered that. And then thirdly, we talked about the fact that the Ten Commandments are an invitation to live a good life. In other words, not just a good life according to pop culture, but a life that God would call good, that actually honors Him and does best by the people around about us. And so right now, I want to jump into commandment number one. Everyone ready? In Cairns and Sunshine Coast, trust you're ready. Here we go. Exodus 20 verse 1 to 3, it says this, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's the intro. Commandment one, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, I've got to admit, when I read that again recently, I thought, how good is this? I'm doing so well at this. My instinct response was, man, that command is easy. No other gods before him. That's fine. I don't have any little Buddha statues in my lounge room and I struggle to even spell uh, Muhammad and I can't figure out Hinduism. And so, you know what? I'm nailing it. Uh, like I'm hard pressed to remember to worship one God, leave alone any other gods. And so I figure I'm certainly not guilty of breaking this one. And so as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, this is good. Let's move on to commandment number two. So far, so good. Nailing it. One out of one. Next. Anyone else tempted to read it that way? And the rest of you, we need to get to the one about not lying. <laughs> Most of us would assume, would it, I'm not even sure there is a God. Or maybe I worship one God. And so this thing about, you know, other gods, no, that, that, that's easy. Move on. But, but I want us to slow down a little bit, uh, necessarily, because I've got to fill another 28 minutes. I want us to slow down because commandment one it is not simply a warm-up lap or a bonus point. In fact, it's the first commandment that actually makes sense of and actually grounds the following nine commandments in some type of coherent reality. Let me, let me explain this and then we're going to see how it works together. And I really think by the end of this message, it's going to help us just to be even more in awe of who God is and what God is like. So to understand why this commandment is first, we need to understand or introduce the idea of monotheism. Everyone say mono. Mono simply means one. Uh, remember when you were a kid, you go bike ride and you do a mono? Anyone else remember that? No, you're all playing Xboxes. You need to get out and about. Um, you put it on one wheel. Uh, let me try it this way. Mono meaning one, mono brow. If someone's got a mono brow, they've got one eyebrow, not two. So, so mono means one, theo, literally, or theos, means God. And so monotheism is the belief that there is one God. Well, at the heart of what the Bible teaches uh, about 
um, God and the nature of God, it teaches this idea of monotheism. There's one God. There's not three gods. There's not five gods. There's not a thousand gods. There's one God. Um, This is not just the first commandment. This is actually the very first thought of the entire Bible. Let me read for you the very first verse of the entire Bible. It's Genesis 1 verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, to all of us, that sounds like a fairly sensible way of starting a book about God, right? If you were to write a book about God, that's probably a fairly tame, sensible way to start it. But, but John Dixon, who we quoted from earlier, he points out that in the original context, that first line of the Bible was incredibly radical. In fact, it was seen as a swipe at all of the other ancient ideas about religion and divinity. You see, in the ancient Near East, which is where Moses lived, when Genesis was written, all types of things were considered to be gods. You could worship a whole stack of different things. People worshipped thunder, people worshipped the sea, people worshipped the sun, people worshipped the moon, people worshipped virtually everything. And yet into that context, the Bible starts with the most... I guess, politically incorrect, charged line that you could imagine. The Bible starts by saying, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, all of the things that you people are all worshipping are not gods at all. There is one God and He created the heavens and the earth. Now, some of you are thinking, cool talk, who cares? Like, so what? What on earth does this have to do with our lives? Well, realise it or not, This actually has a massive impact on how we see the world and how we arrive at our conclusions about what is right and what is wrong in terms of the way that we live. You see, monotheism, the belief that there is one God, and morality are linked. You know how there's some sermons where there's just like three points, they all start with the letter P, they all rhyme, and there's just some funny stories in between each point? This is not one of those sermons. So you you, you need to engage your brain. Just nudge the person next to you and say, switch your brain on. You got to follow me on this. Monotheism and morality are linked together. And here's where I need you to follow me. You see, if there is no God above us, if there's just humanity, peoples, peoples, peoples everywhere, and no God above us, then what we call wrong and what we call right ways of living, in other words, our morals, are really nothing more than just social conventions. Because if there's no God who defines right and wrong, I guess all of us are just left to figure it out ourselves. That's why, and you will have noticed this, the less a society believes in God, the more a society starts to say things like, what's right for you is right for you, and what's wrong for me is wrong for me, and what's good for me is good for me. Truth is what you make it. Ever heard someone say that? You've got to find your truth, and I've got to find my truth. Just be true to yourself. Who knows, those kinds of lines only work in a society that has started to forget God. Because if there is no, if we erase God, then, then there's no one out there to define right or wrong or truth or, or, or what's ugly or what's beautiful or what's admirable and what's desirable and what's detestable. There's no God to define that. So what's true for me is true for me. And I guess what's true for you is true for you. Well, of course we have to figure it out if we've gotten rid of God. Because if there's no God, then morals are just a matter of personal preference. Or morals are defined by the majority of the population. Now, some of you are thinking, what's wrong with that? That sounds like an atheist's dream. But, but think about it. Would murder become right because 51% of the population think it's right? Imagine tomorrow, 51% of the population decide that murder is fine. Does it suddenly become okay? <laughs> Someone in town was yelling at, no! <laughs> well, well I, guess, I guess if you wanted to know, you could ask the Jews who lived through World War II. They would probably have an answer for you. Who knows, racism was legal for many years in many nations. But but even though it was legal, we would look back and say, it may have been legal, but it was wrong. Well, well, why? If morals are just social conventions and it was legal, why is it all of a sudden wrong? Isn't what's true for you, true for you, and true for me, true for me? And if there's no God, don't we just arrive at good and evil ourselves? Aren't they just so... Think about it this way. Is theft okay? So long as as it's your personal preference? This weekend, I've been borrowing Marty Vesetic's WRX. 
and uh, it's a bit better than my Volkswagen Golf. And, and so I've just decided what's true for me is that that WRX is true for me. And who knows, is, is theft okay just because, who knows, no. What about this? Is adultery bad simply because an archaic social convention conditioned us to think it's bad? Well, is, is, is adultery bad just because we've got these old-fashioned ideas still in our mind? Or perhaps maybe, just maybe, altery, uh, adultery is bad because, you know, it typically strains the relationship between mum and dad, right? And, and then results in a home environment that is not as trusting and not as safe and not as conducive for the flourishing of children. So, so, so is, is murder or theft or adultery emphatically and objectively wrong, or are they just matters of preference? If they're wrong, says who? Can, can you see how if there's no God, then there's no higher court of appeal? Is everyone following with me so far? In Cairns and Sunshine Coast, I trust that you're tracking with me. And so if there's no higher court of appeal, then there's nothing and no one that transcends ourselves from which we can arrive at our definitions of what's right and what's wrong. And so you can see that you can't consider moral principles to be universal, that is applicable everywhere, and objective true regardless of who approves of it, unless there is an ultimate God who is universal and whose character provides the logical ground, ground, logical ground for these moral principles. Now, at this point, some people would disagree. You see, at this point, many people would think, well, everyone should be free to just, you know, be true to what they believe and nobody should force their beliefs on anyone. People love to say that. And it sounds wonderful, but in reality, what I believe is probably going to affect you and vice versa. We love to say everyone should be just free to believe whatever they want to believe and no one should force their beliefs on anyone. But, but what if my belief is that women are less valuable than men? Gee, it just went really quiet. There's like some women in here who are picking up stones ready to like... Well, there, there are some worldviews on the planet that say that women are less valuable than men and don't deserve to be educated or to vote. Who knows? It's gone really tense in here tonight. Some of, some of the guys are like, brother, you're on your own here. How are you getting out of this one? I'm trying to make the point that this idea of what I believe is fine for me, and who, who knows, beliefs have implications. What I believe, what about if I believe that the disabled or infants or the elderly or non-productive members of society are not worthy of public resources? Wouldn't that be the logical outworking of Darwinian theory, survival of the fittest? So if we really believe in survival of the fittest, why would we take public resources and give them to the weakest? Shouldn't we reallocate them to the strongest? Some of you are looking at me like, you're a monster. <laughs> I I'm just trying to provoke your thinking here. This idea that, well, all of our thoughts don't have any implications, it's absolute rubbish. What about if I believe that sex should be free of commitment and free of consequences? Well, that's probably going to affect the kid who now grows up without a dad at home. Can you see how beliefs have consequences, ideas have implications? What I believe has a massive effect upon you and what you believe has a huge effect upon me. So this idea that we should all keep it private and kindness is just to never say anything it is actually the way that you end up with a society in moral chaos. God didn't sit in heaven and go, oh, Israel, whatever is right for you is right for you. And whatever's right for me is right for you. Who am I to push it? He, no, God understands that there are certain ideas and beliefs that will lead to destruction and chaos. And there are other ideas and beliefs that are superior, which will lead to a more flourishing, functioning community. Is this making sense tonight? See, if everyone just does what's right in their own eyes, it sounds kind and tolerant, but it actually produces undesirable outcomes and the type of world that none of us would choose to live in. And this is where the Bible says, not only does God exist, but God has imprinted a moral order on the universe. Dixon goes on to say, the existence of God out of whose own character the universe has been made establishes the universal and objective nature of moral actions. Catch this now. Here's the big idea. Some actions are good to the degree that they reflect the reality of God's character imprinted on the world. Some actions are bad to the degree that they shun that imprint. And so the first command, God says, here's my 10 commandments, and here's the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. Because if there is no God, why bother listing the other nine commandments? Live however you want. Everything is optional. Or if there are many gods, again, 
Why bother listing nine more commandments? Because an infinite number of gods would mean an infinite number of versions of what is good and right. But if, as the Bible says, there is one God, we would expect that the laws that God gives, the way that God arrives at what is good and what is evil, is actually a reflection and an outworking of his character. Now can you see why the first commandment had to be, you shall have no other gods before me? Because it's the one that makes sense of and underpins the rationale for the following nine commandments. Yeah, and just like the sun is at the center of the solar system and all of the planets orbit around it. So this first commandment is at the center of the solar system of the Ten Commandments, and the following nine commandments all orbit around this first command. Is this helping anyone tonight? So I guess this is where we arrive at the conclusion that the Ten Commandments are not just an arbitrary policy document. It's not like Moses got the policymakers together. God bless all the policymakers in the universe. God bless you. You will get treasure in heaven. But it's not, like, it's not like Israel just got a policy committee together and came up with 10 arbitrary commandments, nor was there just an ethics committee that, that brainstormed and polled and did some Instagram polls and came up with the 10 most popular ideas. No, every one of the following nine commandments are a window through which we see what God is like. Every command flows from God's character. Every principle flows from God's person. And so as we see the commands, what we're really seeing is the nature of God imprinted upon the universe. So can we do a quick overview? We've got 15 minutes to go, and I want to run through the nine other commands and see what it has to say about God. Here we go. Commandment number two is this. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So God says, I don't want you to have any other idols. On the Sunshine Coast, Cairns, Townsville, wherever you are, I don't want you to have other gods because I am a jealous God. Uh, I've got to admit, I read that and I thought, ooh, that's kind of like jealous. It sounds like a petty boyfriend who, who says to his girlfriend, delete all the numbers of all the other boys you know. You're only allowed to look at me. Hey, did I catch you looking sideways at her? Just look at me, look at me, look at me. Who knows? You read that I'm a jealous God and doesn't it make you feel a little bit like, oh, and a bit insecure? Like, it just, come on, don't act like you weren't thinking it. It, 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 it sounds weird. Like, isn't jealousy bad? So, so, so why would God say, I'm jealous? Well, think about it. There's a bad type of jealousy, but there's also a good type of jealousy. Let, let me illustrate it for you. Imagine, um, uh, imagine oh, I'm sitting at home. There's a knock at the door and uh, I open the door and there's my neighbour uh, standing there with a bunch of flowers. And he says, hey Dustin, um, I'm your neighbour, my name's Jim and I live next door. And uh, for the last few weeks I've been watching your wife through the window and uh, gee, she is hot. So I thought, why would I just sit at home and keep all of this love and affection to myself? So I thought I'm going to come over. And so I walked down your driveway, Duncan, and I picked some of your roses out of the driveway. And I was just wondering if Sarah's not, it's like, it's getting rowdy here in Townsville. I was just wondering if, uh, if she's not doing anything, could I just, you know, take her out for a seafood dinner? Who knows, as he's talking, my fists are starting to clench up. I'm starting to get angry. Imagine if I said, oh, well, come on in, Jim. Yeah, she is free. You would be like, you're a sicko. Why? Because there's a certain type. What's that welling up within me that wants to give Jim the five-fold ministry? That's an old church joke. What, what's that? Give him an old knuckle sandwich. What is it within me that wants to take Jim out and just take him down? What is that? in? Well, I'll tell you what that is. Jealousy. And God says to the nation of Israel, I love you, I've chosen you, and I don't want you to have any other idols, not because I'm insecure, but because I love you like a husband loves a bride. You see, this is a window into what God is like, because some of us imagine God to be this like emotionless figure who just sits up in the clouds and he never feels anything. He doesn't have any emotions. He just sits in heaven and says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And we imagine God to just be like completely feelingless. And God says, here's the first window I want you to see into my character. I love you. I want all of your affection. And it's not because I'm controlling. It's not because I'm petty. It's because I love you like a husband loves his wife. When you worship other gods, that affects me emotionally. I wonder if you've ever imagined God as having emotions. 
That's why the Bible says, it doesn't just say God loved the world. It says God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. You need to understand that when you and I turn from God and worship and offer our lives to other gods, try and get fulfillment through other avenues, God uses strong language in the Bible. He says, it's like you're whoring yourself out to other lovers. Why? Because God is not this emotionless energy or blob in the sky. God has got feelings and God has got passion and God feels for you and He loves you and He he desires you. Who knows? That's a window into the character of God. And so God says, here's the commandment. I don't want you to have any other idols, but here's my character. I'm a jealous God. Number, number three, commandment number three is this. He says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, most of us think that this means don't use God's name as a swear word, right? If you stub your toe, don't use God's name as a swear word. And, and that's true. You shouldn't do that because that would just be annoying. Like imagine your name was Karen and every time someone stubs their toe, they're like, oh, Karen. Like you would get a bit over that if you were Karen. But again, I'm talking about the policymakers of the world. And so, so like you should stop doing that. But, but I reckon there's probably more to it, right? Because remember, the command is a window into the character of God. And so, so what is this? God is saying, I don't want you to just throw my name around as a cover for your own selfish ends. My name is not just a lucky charm for you to use to get whatever you want, like an abracadabra, open sesame, in Jesus' name. I don't want you to use it in vain. I don't want you to throw my name around like it's just a common thing. God is saying, I have a name. I'm a person. I'm not just a formula or a principle. I'm a person. And when you use my name, I want you to see it as sacred. He says, don't take the Lord's name in vain because God's character, God is holy. That doesn't mean boring or old. Holy means separated, sacred, set apart. God is higher than us. And so we live in a world where nothing is sacred anymore. Everything just gets dragged through the dirt. And God says, I don't want you to just throw my name through the dirt and use it to get what you want as some kind of leverage, abracadabra, potion to kind of... This is why we'll get to this in this sermon later in the series, why religious people do bad things in the name of God. God hates it when religious people use his name to meet their own selfish needs. One of the biggest things that we hate is religious hypocrisy, and God hates it as well. That's why God said, don't use my name for your own selfish ends, because my name is not common. My name is holy. Do you understand that tonight? Does it make sense? Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 9. Jesus said, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy, holy be your name. You know, Jesus is actually expressing commandment one, two, and three in one prayer. That no other gods worship him alone and and, and revere, don't use his name in vain. Jesus is covering three commands in the intro to the Lord's prayer. Why? Because we are to uphold God's name with reverence and holiness. You know, some of us have become disappointed with Christianity because we thought that Christianity was a formula, right? Right? It's like, well, if I pray this prayer and I put in the money in the offering, then God will give me the job, the girl, and the house that I want. But it didn't work. And we're trying to use God's name as just a passcode to get what we want. And yet God says, no, I'm not your passcode. I'm a person with a name, and I want to be revered as holy. The next commandment is this. God says, I want you to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord. Okay, that's the command. But but why that command? Well, God actually explains this one for us. So easy. Because in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and then God rested on the seventh day. Can you see how the command flows from God's character? God wants us to see that God's not just a dictator who sits on a throne and never lifts a finger to help his creation. Rather, God says, I want you to work six days and then rest because I myself worked for six days and then rest. So God says, I want you to have a day off where you rest because this is what I'm like. Aren't you glad that God works and then rests? For one, I'm glad he rests because it means we get a day off. But for two, I'm glad that God works because it's through His work that you and I ultimately have rest. You see, the Bible says in Genesis, is everyone still tracking with me tonight? The Bible says in Genesis that in the first 
five days, God makes everything in creation. On the sixth day, God makes man, makes Adam and Eve. On the sixth day, God makes humanity. But then on the seventh day, God rests. So can you see how Adam's first day, Adam wakes up for his first full day on earth. Day seven, he's like, all right, God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Let's go, God. What are we making? Come on, let's go, God. God's like, nothing. It's all done. Adam's like, no, 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 surely you want me to do something. Come on, like I'm a man, I've got to prove myself. Like, God, what do you want me to do? Like, and God goes, no, it's all done, we're resting today. God worked first and rested later so that Adam could rest first and work later. It was a picture of the new creation work where God, through his son Jesus, would work upon the cross. And it's because of his work that our faith experience begins with resting in the finished work of Jesus. Do you catch what I'm saying tonight? And so God says, it's a window into my character. I'm going to ultimately work through Jesus so that you can find rest for your soul. Number five is this, uh, or the fifth commandment, honour your father and your mother. Now, I just think this one should be written in regardless, but, but God says, honour your parents. Well, why would God say that? It's because God is our heavenly father. And none of us have got perfect parents. All of us have got dysfunction in our family, but under normal conditions, parents are our source, our carers, our protectors, our teachers, our providers. And God says, that's what I am to you. I'm your source. I care for you. I protect you. I teach you. I provide for you. And if you can learn to honor your parents who you can see, you're going to be in a good place to know how to honor your heavenly father who you can't see. But again, I'm not just a judge or a force. I'm a father who watches out for you and wants the best for you. Number six, God says you shall not murder. That's a good one. You you, you should just stop murdering people. It can really put an end to things. You shall not murder. Well, what is murder? Murder is different to killing. You see, to kill can be an accident. But who knows, murder is, is calculated. Murder is intentional. Well, how does murder happen? Well, murder happens when someone is so filled with rage that they desecrate the value of another person. You see, murder is actually just hate, full grown, that results in taking another person's life. And God says, I don't want you to do that. But he's not saying, I don't want you to do that because that's naughty. He's saying, I don't want you to do that because that's the exact opposite of who I am. Didn't Jesus say, greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. In other words, don't murder, not because it's naughty, but don't murder because it's the opposite of God. God is love. Hate full-blown turns into murder, but love full-blown turns into a man laying down his life upon the cross out of loving substitutionary sacrifice for you and I. Can you see how this command 15, 1600 years before Jesus was born is a window into who Jesus would be expressing the character of God. Number seven, you you shall not commit adultery. How does adultery happen? Not talking about like going into details, but but, but how does adultery happen? Well, adultery happens when, when a spouse is not meeting expectations and so someone casts aside loyalty and acts unfaithfully. And God says, I don't want you to be unfaithful to your spouse because that's the exact opposite of who I am. I am faithful. And so God out forbids adultery, not because he's against sex, but because he's against a breaking of covenant, because God is a faithful covenant-keeping God. Who knows God is totally faithful in all of his relationships with us. Here's the thing. Even when we don't meet God's expectations, even when we are faithless, the Bible says that God is faithful. He's a God of covenant. Didn't Jesus say, I will never leave you or forsake you? And so everything about God is that God is a covenant-keeping God. In fact, God himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in eternal covenant together. So the very fabric of the universe, they're behind it all, it is a covenant-keeping God. That's why when people go through marriage splits and there's affairs and there's sexual inf- infidelity, they'll say things like, I feel like I'm being torn apart. Why do people feel that? Because the fabric of the universe is a God who is in an eternal covenant relationship. They are literally tearing at the fabric of the universe and the image of God within all of us. Does this make sense tonight? In Cairns, Sunshine Coast, hope this is connecting. Um, Number eight, we're going to keep going. God says, don't steal. 
In other words, God says, don't be a taker because God is generous. God is creative. God is self-giving. The Bible says God is no man's debtor. When you take and steal, you're doing the opposite of what God is like. Number nine, God says you shall not bear false witness. In other words, don't lie about another. Why? Because God himself is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Commandment number 10, God says, don't covet. Now, why would God say don't covet? Well, what is coveting? Coveting is when I see your stuff and I want it. Why? Because I'm discontent, feeling like I need to make a confession about the WRX comment earlier in the message. <laughs> coveting is when I'm, I'm so discontent, I want your stuff. And now every time I'm talking with you, I'm engaging with you with, with a mixed motive because I don't just love you, I love your stuff. So, so can you see how now I, I'm, I'm maneuvering, I'm conniving, I'm manipulating. Why? Because, because I have a discontentment within me and my discontentment it is causing there to be an impurity in my motives. I don't just want what's best for you, I want your stuff. And God says, I don't want you to covet. Why? It's because God in himself is eternally content. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, unbroken. God doesn't need anyone or need anything. And who knows, that's good news for us because it means every time God asks me for something, it's not because he needs my stuff. God's not looking at my money going, oh, gee, man, I'd love to have Dustin's money. God's not looking at my house or, or my car or my time going, oh, I need that to make up for something lacking in me. No, every time God deals with us, it's from a pure motive because God himself is content. And because of that, you and I, can trust him. Can you see how every command is actually a window into what God is like? And how beautiful is God? If you to put it together, God is jealous. God is holy. God works and rests. God is our Father. God is love. God is generous. God is true. God is pure. How good is God? How could you not love that God? How could you not commit yourself to that God? How could you not want to honor and serve that God? How good is the character of God? You know, sometimes I, I, I fear we only ever come to God and come to church for what we can get from Him instead of just acknowledging and appreciating how good God is in Himself. And so we look at the commands and it's a window into God, but here's the problem. It's also a mirror that reveals us. Because as I go through those lists, I think, man, God is all of those things. And, and <laughs> I'm few of those things. God is, is, is jealous, but, but I've got to admit, sometimes I'm apathetic. God is holy. But, but how often I'm, I give myself to just base things. God works and rests, but I tend to either be a workaholic or a sluggard. God is, is completely faithful and trustworthy, and yet we fail to trust Him. God is love, but how often I get angry and just get short with people. Like, what's wrong with me? God is a, a generous giver, but, but I look for what I can take. God tells the truth. And, and I don't lie, but I just tell a version of the truth that makes me look good. I don't act so holy like you don't do the same. Who knows? God is pure in intent, but, but I've got feet of clay. My thoughts, my motives, my intentions, they're so mixed. Even if I think I'm being humble, I think, man, how humble am I? Way more humble than Josh Douglas in Cairns. Like I'm so, and so even when I try to have pure motives, I don't get it right. Here's the thing. The commandments are a window into God's character and they're a mirror back to me that reflects my character. And so when I think, man, I am awesome, then I read that and I realise I'm, I'm maybe a lower grade, maybe like diet awesome, awesome light. Like I'm, I'm, I'm probably not, I need a saviour is where I arrive at. I shared this morning, if you walk into the bathroom and, and you look in the mirror and you see there's dirt on your face, how grateful are you to have a mirror? Because otherwise you didn't know there was dirt. Now imagine you walk into the bathroom and there's like spinach in your teeth. These days you've got to save that spinach. That's worth a fortune. But, but <laughs> save that, that's like 20 bucks worth. Um, imagine you walk into the bathroom, you see you got spinach in your teeth. Who knows, thank God for the mirror because your lousy friends wouldn't tell the truth. They all bore false witness against you. So the mirror is helpful because it reveals your condition. But who knows, it's gonna be darn awkward if you then try and rip the mirror off the wall to get the spinach out of your teeth. Who knows, the mirror was never there to clean you. The mirror was there just to reveal you to you. And if you can understand that, you can understand what the law does. God never gave us a law 
so that we can save ourselves or cleanse ourselves or make ourselves good enough for God. A law can't do that any more than a mirror can do that. But what it does do is it reveals me back to me and it gives me a window into God's glory. And it makes me realise, man, like I'm, I'm okay, but I need God's help. I need God's grace. And that's exactly why God sent Jesus. Jesus came. He lived the perfect life. He died upon the cross, not for his sin, but for our sin. So that you and I, the Bible says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. You and I, thank God for his law. It helps us to know our need for a saviour. Thank God for Jesus, that he was willing to shed his blood so you and I could be forgiven and made clean before God.